Okay, so welcome to CMP591 uh, Broadband Wireless Networks. My name is Tuna Tuğucu. Uh, here's the contact information. You can access the uh, course slides uh, in our Moodle server. And this is my contact information. I would prefer uh, you contact either by uh, the telephone or uh, directly through email, which would be much easier probably for you. Please do not forget to put uh, the line CMP591 so that I understand about which course you're uh, sending the email. We have two assistants that will assist the course uh, this semester. These are Birkan Yilmaz and Shukri Kuran. Both of, uh, both of them are my uh, postdoc students. They got their PhD degrees in our lab with me. So uh, this uh, chapter is mostly introduction to the course and uh, We'll be first giving some information about the course and then what we will be uh, covering uh, in the rest of the semester. So the objective is to introduce the concepts and also research topics, since you're all graduate students, uh, in emerging wireless broadband networks. There's no textbook, yet there are several uh, the books you can use as a reference. These are listed here, so I will just skip this. You can get all this information, again, from the slides. Uh, for the grading, we will have two midterms. Uh, in total, they will have 40% weight in your uh, total grade. And we will have two projects and a final exam. And what we will cover in this course will be, we will be discussing uh, in detail the wireless lens. Of course, we will be focusing on 802.11 in the stage. We will be briefly looking at wireless pens, but we will not go into the details of wireless pens. We will be focusing on uh, wireless metropolitan area networks. There, our main focus will be IEEE 802.16, also known as WiMAX. Uh, we'll be uh, spending two or three weeks on WiMAX, and hopefully, if you have uh, sufficient time, we'll be uh, slightly talking about, in general, uh, wireless communication networks and try to provide some brief information about LTE, but that will not be our focus. But our main focus on this course will be cognitive radio networks. We'll be uh, uh, spending most of our time, uh, something like five or six weeks on cognitive radio. And if we have time, we may be looking at things like 80222. That will be actually slightly covered inside the discussion for cognitive radio networks. So. Uh, as I said, uh, in this lecture we will be uh, discussing some uh, basic details and try to introduce you the course, uh, what we will do uh, in the semester. So let's first uh, start with the discussion of wireless local area networks. Wireless local area networks were actually brought in as an alternative to the existing local area, wired local area networks. The idea was to make whatever is available to your desktop also available to your laptop. Okay, So the important thing there is actually uh, the laptop or notebook computer, or nowadays the tablets, of course, they're untethered. So there are no cables attached. Therefore, in a sense, they're mobile. However, they're not mobile like your cell phones. The difference is the following. When you're working with your tablet or with your uh, notebook, typically you're not moving fast. So mostly these are for nomadic use, especially the wireless local area network design itself was for nomadic use, not for mobile use. The difference is here. In the case of nomadic use, uh, for example, here I have my laptop uh, working. So at the moment, it's connected to our CMP uh, wireless LAN here. When the lecture is over, I will just close the lid so it goes into standby, and then go to my office. And when I open it up, it should again connect to the network. Since I'm in the same building, it will be actually the same wireless local area network, yet it will be over a different access point. Or maybe, if I don't have time, I will not go to the office, but I will go home. And then when I open my notebook, it should connect to my network 
in home. The Wi-Fi network at my home. Okay? So this is nomadic work. I'm working like a nomad. Stay, uh, stay here for some time, do communications, but then disconnect and move when I'm disconnecting, typically. And again, stop. And I work only when I stop, not on the move. In the case of mobile networks, for example, you read, of course, not while driving, but while, for example, while my wife is driving the car, I can read my email or browse the web. In that case, it's mobile. That means communication continues as I'm moving. Okay? Now, wireless LAN was typically meant for nomadic use. So the mobile networks are like uh, GSM, GPRS, Edge, LT, and others. But wireless LAN itself was initially, the idea, the concept was to provide communications to stationary nodes that are wireless connected. But these nodes are capable of appearing somewhere else later on. So you should also handle mobility in some sense, but not as mobile as a mobile network. Okay? It came up with two uh, different modes. One was the infrastructure-based mode, and the other one was the ad hoc mode. The difference here is, we'll be uh, seeing it also in the following slides, actually, let me, sorry, should be somewhere here. Seems like I have placed it somewhere else, sorry. sorry. Uh, the difference is the following. In the case of infrastructure mode, uh, there is an access point which is uh, AC power connected, so it doesn't have a power problem. It also has an uplink, a safe uplink, which is typically wired. It doesn't have to be wired, but typically it's wired. So the problem here is the wireless connection between the access point and the uh, wireless nodes in the network. Okay, so there is always an infrastructure there. That's, a, for example, the case here. We have uh, over 16 access points in the building, and uh, these are connected uh, with a gigabit Ethernet to our backbone. Okay, and they're also always on power in 20, uh, 220 volts, so there's no power problem either. Now the problem is. I should have coverage everywhere in the building. So how many access points should I deploy and where should I deploy them? And it should provide sufficient quality in the wireless link. However, in the case of ad hoc mode, this time you don't have any infrastructure. Typically ad hoc uh, networking is meant for, for example, uh, in the case of a disaster. So let's say an earthquake hits, so all your network is down, all the infrastructure is gone, maybe you don't even have power. So how do you provide communications? Then since you don't have the infrastructure, you don't have the access points, you talk to your closest neighbor, and your neighbor relays your information, relays your packet on your behalf to others. If you're trying to get connected to the internet or PSTN, in other words, the outer world, then we should also have someone serving as the gateway to our group. Maybe with some other technology, but uh, that person's computer will serve as a relay for everyone in this group. Maybe there are several of them, so I may have alternatives. Or I may be uh, passing this role in a round robin fashion or in some other fashion between the nodes, for example, to distribute the load. But ad hoc networks typically work without any infrastructure. Typically, ad hoc networks do not perform as well as uh, the infrastructure-based systems. Therefore, they are typically meant for the case where an infrastructure does not exist. So it is not coping with uh, infrastructure-based mode, but it is another technology, another alternative, when the infrastructure itself is not available. Typical wireless LAN access points have uh, a coverage of tens of meters in radius. 
So in this sense, also it's different from the cellular networks. But note that the cellular networks are actually approaching <laughs> the uh, virus local area networks in size lately with the uh, PICO uh, networks and then the femtocells and uh, now the term small cell. They're getting closer there, but now the idea is slightly different. There the idea is that uh, if you try to provide wireless connection to a wider area, then there will be so many clients in there. And typically nowadays the clients require too much bandwidth. Now if you sum the bandwidth requirement from so many users, your access point is not, or your base station does not have such a high uh, capacity to support all these requests. So what happens is you chop the area into smaller pieces and you install more base stations or access points, however you name them. Okay, so that, that's why actually cellular networks are also getting smaller and smaller. But the concept here is slightly different. Typically they operate at 2.4 gigahertz and 5 gigahertz because these are license free. Remember these are the ISM bands reserved for industrial and uh, scientific and medical use. Uh, so it doesn't require a license to communicate in this uh, band. If you try to communicate, for example, in the bands that are uh, reserved for, let's say, GSM or UMTS, uh, then you're not allowed to do it. The only way for you to transmit signals at the uh, GSM or UMTS bands is you should have the SIM card of an operator. That means you also have an agreement with that operator. But that means actually you have the license. Otherwise, you don't have the permission to do that. You cannot just go to uh, an electronics shop and take a device from the shelf and start transmission. You have to abide with the rules of the operator because the operator has the exclusive rights for using that frequency band in that specific uh, area for those years. Typically, it is leased for 20 or 30 years by the uh, regulatory bodies. Uh, but nowadays, we'll see that uh, people are also jumping to the 60 gigahertz band because that's also unlicensed. It allows fixed access, nomadic access, as we discussed. The main focus is actually the nomadic access. Uh, but you can have it fixed, like my iMac computer uh, upstairs. It's connected both over wired and wireless. So if the wired network somehow fails, I can still communicate over wireless. But typically, of course, for fixed, you try to provide the wired access. And also some mobility, but limited mobility. There are uh, standards uh, going on in the wireless local area network uh, area. Uh, two of the famous uh, standards are the IEEE 802.11 family of standards. It's not a single standard, it's just a family of standards. And it has been improving uh, for over a decade. It's been almost two decades since uh, 802.11 uh, family has started. Uh, it has many alternatives. Some you know by name, some probably you don't. You will, we will be discussing that. IEEE 802.11 is also known by the name Wi-Fi, which stands for virus fidelity. Uh, Wi-Fi is actually slightly different than 802.11. 802.11 itself is a standard. Wi-Fi is the consortium by the companies. But of course, they're intelligent enough to go hand in hand with the standard itself. Because most of uh, those in Wi-Fi uh, are also in 802.11 standards, or at least they're following the uh, standards, uh, so that all the products that are coming out from Wi-Fi certificate, with a Wi-Fi certificate, are typically 802.11 compatible. Uh, there is yet another family by Etsy that was developed by European Union. Uh, it's the Hyperland family that came as Hyperland 1 and then followed by Hyperland 2. These are very good standards, but what was missing in the European Union was uh, these were developed uh, with, the, with the enforcement of the Union, 
but there was no support from the companies. They excluded the companies. That's why they got very nice standards, but no one implemented them. Then it doesn't make sense. So now, do we have the standard? Yes, we do. Are they good? Yes, they're fine. Does any, can you buy such a product? No, no one is producing it. That's why actually this branch itself has died. That's why we'll be giving our focus on IEEE 802.11, but you should also know that there's something like this and you should understand what is similar and what's the difference. What are the advantages of these uh, virus local area access te technologies? Most important thing is it's their widespread use. If something becomes so much widespread, it becomes dominant in the market, whether it is good or not. Okay? So, IEEE uh, 802.11 products are widespread, used all over the world. Of course, it's some differences, like uh, the products you find in uh, Europe or US are different from what you find in Japan, mostly due to some regula uh, regulatory uh, differences, but the general concepts are similar. Another very important thing is the ease of deployment. You don't need a technician to start uh, a Wi-Fi access point. Just go and buy any one of those access points out in the market, from a technology market. Plug it in, and it will start working. It's so easy to deploy. However, in the case of, for example, if you consider some alternative technologies, like, let's say, uh, 2G or 3G, uh, first of all, you need the license. Putting away, uh, aside the problem with the license, if you just go and buy an access point, you cannot just plug it in and start using it. Installing a base station is pretty difficult. Okay? That's why this thing has been uh, so much widespread. And of course, the other reason for widespread is the low cost of Wi-Fi. It's cheap, so everyone can afford it. If you need any Wi-Fi access points, I have three access points in my uh, room that are not being used, so it's really cheap. The disadvantages are, first of all, security. Remember, in the incentives, I didn't discuss about security. In the beginning, we didn't mean anything about security. In the beginning, the main concern was, by then, the uh, technology I had on my desktop was uh, 10 megabps for Ethernet. So you should provide something at least close to 10 megabits. And that was difficult. So this thing started with 1 megabps, 2 megabps. So the main concern by then was providing access. So there was no security in mind. Then security came as a patch. And with all patches, of course, that's difficult. One uh, important problem with the security part is that in the case of the cable, copper or fiber doesn't matter. When you have a cable, you have a guided medium. The signal propagates only in that medium. And if you properly shield it, and if you can protect your cable, then you know that it is at least, to some extent, it's secure. Okay. If somebody taps in to the cable, now first of all, tapping into the cable is a little bit difficult, and it's visible. If somebody taps in to the cable that's going on there, I will be suspicious and inform uh, the people at the other end of this cable, saying, someone is playing with your cable, is it from uh, Turk Telecom or are those your guys, or is it someone else? However, in the case of wireless, you just sit in your home, the signal comes to you. Because the signal propagates not only to the target, but almost everywhere. Of course, you can do beam forming so that you can send it towards the target, but still, it's not only the target who is hearing. Like, if I'm trying to send a signal to, let's say, Jam, but Turul is very close to him, so Turul also hears the message. 
physically there's a problem. So then I have to be careful with how I encode it, uh, so that uh, sorry encrypt it, so that only the uh, destination gem can decrypt it, but not two rows. Okay, but then if I'm trying to make it widespread, so that people may join in and out, then this is yet another trouble in security. Like, I want to provide access to everyone in Bose University. But then if I try to distribute keys for uh, the wireless access, there are 12,000 students in this university. And if I give the same key to 12,000 people, I'm not sure that it will not leak to someone else. So once in a while, I may want to renew the keys. But then how do I redistribute the new keys? So it is a more complex problem. Unreliability of the virus medium is yet another one. In the case of cable networking, if the cable is not damaged, and typically the connectors are not damaged, probably there's nothing going wrong. That's why communication over cable is mostly reliable. However, in the case of wireless, the wireless signal fluctuates. The quality of the wireless signal fluctuates a lot. Even in two consecutive seconds, the quality of signal changes. Therefore, you have to cope with this. Also, uh, what's the error rate uh, in, for example, fiber? Pro what's the probability of error? 10 to the minus 30. Very, very, very low. It's very, very low. It's in the range 10 to the minus 12 to 15. Okay? It's very low. It, it, it practically means almost no errors occur during the day. Or maybe at most once or twice. That's all. However, in the case of wireless, the probability is 10 to the minus 3, 10 to the minus 4, typically. And maybe even worse. So this is like, what? How many times it's worse? One billion times worse. It's quite different. So you have to cope with that. That is why, for example, remember the OSI layered structure. In OSI, if there was an error, what was the cause of the error? Why would an error occur in OSI? For example, consider TCP. If in TCP you have a timeout, which means the transmitted message did not, did not go to the destination, at least you think so. Why would you think uh, this happened? Noise or disconnection. What? Noise or <coughs> disconnection, maybe. Did TCP work with that idea? Um, if, if there was a timeout, what does TCP do? It returns it. And how about the rate? It decreases the rate. It halves the rate immediately. Why? Okay, it retransmits because you know the packet didn't go. That's why you transmit. But why do you have the transmission uh, rate? Yes. You don't want to increase congestion. Remember, TCP was actually designed for wired networks. There were no wire, not there were wireless networks by then, but uh, mostly it was wired networks. So TCP was designed according to typically the wired networks. And the idea was, if there's an error, there should be some congestion somewhere. The probability of errorless transmission was very, very low, even with the technology of that day. If there was a problem, probably one of the intermediate routers had a buffer overflow because the link was not, did not have sufficient transmission capability. The incoming rate was higher than the outgoing rate. That's why uh, it happened. So let me throw the, uh, the uh, transmission rate. Let me decrease my transmission rate so that I can help the congestion uh, to be beaten. Okay, that was the concept. However, in the case of wireless, the probability of congestion is low because we have very low data rates. Typically, if there is an error, it's not because of congestion. It is because of Airless transmission in the physical layer. So
So note that the concepts need to change in the case of wireless. Wireless is not like wire just going over the air. It's completely different. Typically contention-based access. So there are many users, and typically these are mobile users. So I don't know how many users are in my network at the moment or not. At the moment, most of your cell phones probably have the Wi-Fi enabled. But my access point is not aware of that unless your phone tries to send something. Okay? So I don't know how many real users are there in my uh, cell. Okay? And when we have the break, probably you will just go out of the building to fetch some tea. And then the number of users actually will decrease. And my access point, again, will not be aware of that. So I cannot typically go with reservation-based mechanisms most of the time. Typically, we use contention-based mechanisms. But still, I need to provide quality of service. So for those cases where I need high quality of service, I may still be using something similar to reservation-based schemes. But most of the time, we're going with contention-based access. How about the wireless personal area networks, wireless PANs? Uh, it's an alternative to personal area networks, like USB and FireWire. Typically, the device range is something like 3 to 5 meters, or sometimes 10 meters, but not further. The operating frequency varies. Typically, again, you try to use that ISM band, because it's for personal use, not through an operator. So at 2.4 gigahertz, for example, you have Bluetooth. And we also have wireless USB. Uh, the standards that are related to wireless pens are for Bluetooth to 15.3, 15.4 for Zigbee, and wireless USB. How about the metropolitan area network? Now the concept changes. Remember, in the case of Wi-Fi, wireless lens, actually, the idea was I already had the wired local area networks. So whatever was available to my desktop, that should be available to my notebook. That was the concept. And it should be available to my untethered or wireless device. In the case of wireless metropolitan area networks, now we have the ADSL or in general XDSL. We have the XDSL technology that's going to the homes, but how does the XDSL work? It works over the telephone wire, the copper loop that goes to your home. Okay. Now, how about the alternative that I'm not using that one, because that copper uh, loop is set up by the uh, carrier, the telephone carrier. So I have to work over that carrier. In the case of uh, Turkey, that carrier would be Turk Telecom. So you have to work over the cable of Turk Telecom. But then that means if you're a company that is using that cable to provide service, then you have to pay to Turk Telecom. You have to pay some of your share to Turk Telecom, which the, operator, uh, the service providers do not want. Also, it is possible that uh, sometimes you have places where you don't have that copper wire going, like the new buildings. Or maybe you might want something like, at home, I have my uh, XDSL service, and I'm distributing that service through Wi-Fi in home. So I just open my uh, notebook and work using the uh, XDSL service with high data rates. Of course, not in Turkey. Uh, but then, when I go somewhere else, let's say I go to a coffee shop, and I want to continue working there, I want it to be transparent. I want to be able to work in the coffee shop as if I'm at home with some comparable quality of service and with some comparable data rate. Then that means you should have a service comparable to what you have at home in the coffee shop. 
Now you might say, well, the coffee shop also has some internet service and distributes it over Wi-Fi. How about having this, let's say, out in the parks? Or in a place where you don't have that service, or you have to pay for that service, but you don't want to do that because you're already paying for the service. So Wireless Man was designed with this uh, initiative. Provide service that is not exactly equivalent to XDSL, but comparable to XDSL in a wireless manner. That one also had two modes, but you know in computer engineering, we love uh, having new names. So this time, uh, the names are PMP, point to multi point, and the mesh mode. The PMP mode is actually the infrastructure-based mode. You have an access point or the base station, doesn't matter, it's the same thing by the way. It's just, you call it access point when we're talking about ATO 211. Uh, in other cases, we call it base station, it's the same concept. You have the base station, and over the base station, you directly con communicate with the base station, and over the base station, you access the internet or PSDN, whatever. In the case of mesh mode, this is like ad hoc mode, but slightly different, especially in the case of uh, WiMAX. You still have a base station, but what if you're out of the coverage of the base station? In re regular cellular networks, like GSM, UMTS, LT, whatever, if you're out of coverage of the base station, you're gone. You don't have the connection. But what if I cannot access the base station, but I can access someone who can access the base station? So, especially in the case of WiMAX, there's still a base station, which is active in the coordination also part. However, you don't access the access point directly, but you access it over one or more hubs. One or more, sorry, relay stations. So it means two or more hubs. Okay? So that would be the mesh mode. We'll be discussing that in detail. Uh, typical wireless metropolitan area network base stations have a coverage of tens of kilometers in radius. But as I said, as the radius increases, that means the service area increases, there will be so many clients that want to connect. And if these clients, each one has high data uh, requirements, then the sum would be too high. So that means in uh, in, the, let's say, big cities, having such large radius is not a very good idea. In Istanbul, in New York, in London, in Paris, whatever, if you want to uh, deploy a WiMAX base station or some other uh, metropolitan area network base station, you would prefer to have smaller cells. Yes, you could cover it, but your data rate would not be sufficient. Okay? However, in places where, uh, for example, to cover rural areas, like in Turkey, consider Konya, or uh, in the United States, consider uh, outskirts of, let's say, Arizona, whatever. In such cases, now, the homes are so distant the homes or the small towns, villages, whatever, they're so distant from each other that to cover 10 people there, you have to lay kilometers of cables if you want to go with the cabled approach. And the uh, cost of laying this cable per customer is not worth the uh, money you're getting. So in terms of CAPEX, this system will fail. So what happens? The operator does not want to provide the service to such areas. But normally you're supposed to provide also service, connectivity to those people. So here, metropolitan, various metropolitan area networks provide a nice alternative. Since you have large coverage, now you can install one base station in the rural area. And you will cover a very wide service area However, the number of people there, therefore, the total request will still be reasonable. 
So Viles metropolitan area networks are especially useful in such scenarios. But also, as I said, in uh, the city itself, because, uh, for example, if you have, uh, let's say, Vimax on your laptop, then you can work at home, work on the street, at the park, at the coffee shop, in uh, office. Always you would be connected over the same service. Okay? The operating frequency is from 6 to 66 uh, gigahertz. Of course, not the whole band. That means uh, you have the service sometimes around 6, sometimes around 2, sometimes about around 3 gigahertz, but also around 66 gigahertz. Mostly it's in the range 2 to 6, by the way. It allows, again, fixed nomadic and the same while used properly. The standards are, again, <laughs> similar. There was the IEEE uh, approach and Etsy approach from Europe. Again, the Europeans just went with the standards. Nobody implemented it. Again, on the uh, IEEE side, they took the companies in during the standard development. So that was produced. So you have its alternatives. But interestingly, here, we also have Vibra. The Koreans did something great. Now, the IEEE world was uh, trying to develop the Vimax standard. And there were also the opponents of Vimax who claimed that Vimax would not work. So the Koreans did something very nice, and they really helped Vimax. What they did was they took a frozen image of the Vimax standard. It was still in the process. They said, okay, we will not implement the current or the uh, emerging uh, state of the standard, but we're taking this one. Let's just implement this and see if it works or not. So what they did was not fully Vimax, but it was very close to Vimax. So it was called Wireless uh, Broadband Access with the name Vibro. It was given into service in uh, Korea, and it proved that the standard for Vimax was reasonable, and it worked. And it really helped the deployment of Vimax in other places later. So the advantages are the wide area of coverage <coughs> compared to Wi-Fi and uh, wireless in general. Ease of deployment, well, still some ease of deployment, but of course not like uh, wireless lens and the mobility support comparable to cellular systems. The disadvantages was the immature technology, actually later on it matured. Call to service was in the technology during the design phase. It was not a patch. From day one, there was the call to, of concern, uh, call to of service concerns. So the technology itself was designed according to call to of service provisioning. That was very important and also security was part of it. But the most important thing here is quality of service was not something uh, like the cream on the cake. Quality of service was in the cake itself. So in terms of providing quality of service, Vimax was not comparable to the others. Uh, when we look at wireless mesh networks in general, this could be taken as part of Vimax because of the mesh mode, but uh, the concept of wireless mesh is actually broader. It's more than Vimax mesh mode. The mesh mode provides multiple paths between the nodes. Typically, it is known as the ad hoc mode, but some methods are based on a central station also, as in the case of Vimax mesh mode. It allows fixed, nomadic, and some mobile users now, mobility is, in general, a problem. In the case of mesh, it's more of a problem. Because this time, you're not, you don't have some fixed base stations. Sometimes you're out of coverage of a base station, but there are other nodes uh, around. So to which one should I do a handoff? Can I do a handoff to that node? If I do a handoff to that node, what happens to my quality of service? So 
providing quality of service in case of mobility in mesh mode is more difficult than doing it for uh, infrastructure mode. Uh, wireless mesh networks do not typically have standards on its own, but some wireless network standards have mesh alternatives. One of them is, as I said, 802.16 mesh mode, and the other one is, for example, in 802.11s, there is some mesh mode, but this time it is mesh between the access points, not between the users. Not directly available to the users, but you're deploy deploying your uh, access points in a mesh mode, rather than having a direct access to the network, for example. Okay, so how about the cellular networks? Uh, 3G net, the next generation networks in general, uh, and also including GSM networks, fall into this field. The users are now considered to be mobile, not nomadic. So you should be able to communicate when you're stationary, but also when you're on the move. Uh, 3G is arguably the most widely used wireless network in history so far. Now, uh, uh, sorry, 2G is uh, so. 3G still has not the same number as far as I know. The standards are typically backed by world leading telecommunication companies, the vendor companies. And unlike wireless personal area networks and wireless local area networks, only licensed frequencies are used. Note that the, in all countries, the wireless spectrum, radio spectrum, is a resource of the nation and it cannot be sold to any company. So what happens is uh, the, uh, the wireless frequencies, uh, the spectrum, the portions of the spectrum are leased to companies, but uh, to make these huge investments for the very complex networks, these companies typically request that they are leased for long duration. So typically they are uh, leased for two or three decades. And uh, for that long duration now the companies do the investment. Uh, but also parts of the uh, spectrum are leased or uh, at least assigned to uh, other purposes. Uh, for uh, uh, to other organizations for different purposes, like uh, parts of the spectrum is uh, given to, let's say, uh, the uh, army, part of it is given to the navy, part of it is uh, reserved for uh, civilian air traffic control. Uh, again, part of it is again leased to companies, uh, for example, for uh, radio, for TV, uh, for satellite communications, and some parts of it are uh, left aside for, sorry, uh, left aside uh, for uh, li unlicensed access, as in the case of ISM. Okay, so all these unlicensed technologies are limited in that narrow unlicensed band, and the rest is organized by the regulatory body of the uh, nation. However, uh, through ITU. These regulatory uh, organizations in the countries, like in Turkey, the regulatory body is BTK, previously TK, uh, now BTK. Uh, in the United States, that's FCC. In the uh, United Kingdom, it's Ofcom. These are different institutions or uh, regulatory bodies, but they are all together in ITU in collaboration. So what happens is when a new technology is coming in, ITU, typically ITU are in this case, takes part in uh, this uh, process and they try to make sure that that frequency is almost available in all countries. It's difficult to guarantee that it will be available in all countries. But these regulatory bodies try to synchronize as much as possible so that when a new technology comes in, it is designed for a band that is available in most of the countries, at least in the target markets. So that when a vendor company produces some hardware that works at, let's say, uh, 3 gigahertz, let's say in the United States, or uh, let's say in Germany, 
then when it goes to Austria, it shouldn't be making a new design for Austria or another one for France, another for United Kingdom, another one for Turkey. If they come up with a design, they would like to sell the same design, the same product in almost all countries. But you may see that European Union countries are better synchronized among each other, whereas United States is a little bit apart from Europe. Maybe sometimes they're better uh, synchronized with, for example, Canada, because they're almost the same market. Whereas, for example, the Far East is separate. Japan, for example, typically diverts from both United States and European Union. That's why, for example, if you look at 2G, you see that the spectrum used for 2G in US is different from what you have in Europe. That's different from what you have in Japan. Turkey, for example, has been mostly synchronized with the European Union. That's why, for example, for 2G technologies, the cell phones we had were compatible for Europe, but not for US or for Japan. But in the case of 3G, for example, there has been better collaboration, so the bands were a little bit better organized. The standards are backed by uh, world-leading telecommunication companies, as we said. Okay, and I just messed up because of this guy. Unlike uh, wireless personal area and wireless local area networks, as we said, license frequencies are used. If you uh, look at the cellular network families, we have the UMTS, uh, which is based on GSM, uh, typically developed by European Union and Japan together. This time, as I said, in 3G, for example, Japan and Euro uh, European countries collaborated better. And UMTS-based add-ons and new versions of UMTS have come into play. So now you have HSPA, LT, and LT Advanced, or also known as LT-A, uh, are now being available. On the other side, in the US, they followed the success of IS-95, which was based on CDMA. So they came up with CDMA 2000, and uh, from that, they had the EVDO. Uh, in the case of 3G, Everything was under the uh, umbrella of IMT 2000, but somehow Europe and United States managed to have two incompatible technologies under the same umbrella. So uh, the CDMA 2000 and UMTS are very similar, but not compatible. That's why still uh, you, you cannot use the same cell phone uh, in the other uh, network. So another approach is the cognitive radio approach. The problem is, as I just mentioned, in every country, there is a regulatory uh, organization that decides which part of the spectrum is assigned or leased to which organization or company. But this is fixed assignment. That means, for example, uh, to the army, you say, I'm giving you this portion of the spectrum for this purpose. So they make all their designs or their purchases according to that frequency band. Now you cannot change it. If you need some spectrum, you cannot tell the army to move all their equipment from this spectrum portion to somewhere else. Because that would mean trashing all the systems. Okay, so it is typically fixed, but from here we come to the uh, problem of actually fragmentation. Just as we had in the operating systems, the memory fragmentation problem, now with the spectrum, we have the spectrum fragmentation problem. The spectrum is terribly fragmented, assigned to some technologies, and most of these technologies are almost outdated then you need to harvest back those technologies which were assigned to outdated technologies and make them available. But this is not an easy process. You cannot do it the other day. 
Like at the moment, this process is uh, going on with the terrestrial uh, TV services in the UHF band. So uh, all over the world, people are switching to the digital telecommunications, uh, digital TV services. So uh, the typical, the old-fashioned TV services in the UHF band are being terminated. It has been done in uh, the United States. It's been done in European countries. We were supposed to have uh, done it by now, but it seems like uh, we will be able to complete that transition by 2014. But still, we also have to do it. What happens is we get rid of these uh, TV stations, these towers, and uh, all communications is going digital, either over satellite or over uh, cable, fiber, whatever. But uh, everyone is switching to the digital uh, TV services. So some portion of the frequency is becoming available. But unfortunately, this is not sufficient. If you consider the increase in the uh, spectrum requirement, everyone is turning mobile, and the mobile data request, the mobile data requirement is doubling all the time. Okay, so still that's not sufficient. So we should find a way of better utilizing these uh, the uh, open uh, places in the spectrum. If you look at the spectrum, you see that parts of the spectrum are under heavy use. Here the x-axis is the uh, frequency for a given time duration. And part of it is, in, is under medium use, and part of it is sparsely used or maybe not used at all. Okay? But unfortunately, this unused space, and also this medium use space, has been assigned to some technology, so I cannot use it. That's a problem. So if I can find a technology that will de detect these underutilized portions of the spectrum and better utilize it, then that would be very nice for me. And the cognitive radio technology, or the dynamic spectrum access networks, or XG networks, are typically looking into this problem. These are almost equivalent terms. They're very similar, but uh, the term dynamic spectrum access is actually fitting this better. The spectrum here is dynamic. So you're adapting to dynamic variations in the spectrum. Cognitive radio is actually uh, composed of cognitive devices. They're cognitive in the sense that they're aware of what is going on in the environment. They're able to understand the existing radio environment. And then they're trying to adapt to that radio environment. In that sense, cognitive radio is actually making use of the dynamic spectrum access network technology to achieve this. This is also called opportunistic networking because it works in an opportunistic manner. Wherever there is availability, it's jumping to that area. Somehow this turned into black and white. It's, it's supposed to be in color, sorry. I will uh, correct it in the slides. But if you look at this, here, this axis is the frequency, and this vertical axis is the power of transmission, and this axis, this horizontal axis, is the time axis. So as you can see, as time passes, if you look at a specific frequency band, sometimes it's used, as in here, sometimes it's not. If you look at a specific time duration, some frequencies are not used at all, as in here, while some are used and some are heavily used. Okay? So if I can find a method that will detect these holes in the spectrum, 
These are called spectrum holes. If I can detect these holes and utilize these holes as long as they are not used, that would be very nice. So I would be better utilizing the spectrum. However, this spectrum does not belong to me. It belongs to someone else. So in that sense, the real owner of that spectrum, the licensed user of that spectrum, is called either the licensed user or the primary user. And now I'm the unlicensed user or the secondary user, however you call it. Okay? So if I guarantee that as soon as the primary user, the real owner of the user, the one who has a license for that band, comes in, if I guarantee that I will immediately terminate that band and try to find myself another hole, if I can do it very fast, then it would be reasonable. Okay. But what is very fast? That's a vague term. Of course, you should define it. If I cannot find a hole, then it should be me who is preempted or dropped, not the primary network. Okay? So it is my responsibility to make sh sure that I detect the existence of the primary user. Because don't forget that the primary network is a legacy network. It was designed, implemented, and deployed before the cognitive radio network. Therefore, if there's, a, uh, if there's someone who's, uh, who has to carry the responsibility of doing this, it should be the new technology coming in. You cannot ask the owner of the old technology to modify his or her technology so that I can also work there. In other words, assume, for example, the 2G, 3G systems. Assume that someone comes in and says, tonight, buy a new phone so that I can also work here as a secondary user. Why am I going to make an expense for your benefit? I wouldn't do that. And since I'm the licensed user, it is your responsibility to do all the expenses and also make sure that you're not damaging, harming my communications. Okay? So it shouldn't, you shouldn't expect anything. Literally, you shouldn't expect any changes in the primary network or the primary user. This should all be handled by the secondary network. So here, now the problem is how you do this sensing. You have to sense the hole, which means also you have to sense the entry of the primary user, which is quite difficult. Also, you should be able to differentiate between the primary and the secondary user. It's like, uh, let's say both of us are secondary users, and there's also a primary user. Now, when you want to transmit, you see that someone is transmitting. But if you're not able to differentiate between the primary user and me as a secondary user, if you cannot understand who is primary, who is secondary, since you see I'm transmitting, you might refrain from, tr from transmission saying that, OK, there is a primary user. Actually, you have the same rights as I do. If you unnecessarily refrain from using the channel, actually, it's on my benefit, but not yours. So it's not fair, in other words. The uh, network could be deployed in different phases. This, is, this slide is uh, also the previous one is from uh, Professor Achilles. Uh, so uh, it could be that there is some unlicensed band uh, some, and also some licensed bands in here. Okay. So in the unlicensed band, okay, you can uh, use as you wish. So there is a primary base station for the primary network, and this primary user is communicating using that license band to that primary network. Similar is going on here with some other band, with some other operator, and uh, that operator's 
user. Uh, in here, you may have the next generation user or users either communicating between each other in an ad hoc manner or communicating with some next generation base station. But while these uh, nodes are communicating, there will also be nodes that, that are communicating with this primary network, primary users still. So you should make sure that you're not harming them when you're communicating. Also, you should have some means of communications also with these guys. Like this node, for example, could be able to talk to the primary network using the license band, but also be able to communicate with the next generation users in the cognitive manner. So it could, for example, serve also as a gateway for, for this group. And uh, there, there will not be only one uh, cognitive operator. Typically, there will be more than one cognitive operator who are trying to provide service. However, they're providing the service using the frequencies that belong to other operators or other uh, frequency holders. So, in other uh, terms, there are several players here. There are companies or organizations, whatever, there are institutions that hold the license for that band. Let's call them the frequency holders. So there are several frequency holders who want to make their channels available, for example, for cognitive access. Why? Because probably you will pay them. As, as you use, you're going to pay them. There are also service providers who want to provide service to these uh, to the users using the frequencies of these frequency holders and there are the people like us who want to get the service from these service providers and there should typically be someone who's sitting in the middle uh, who's providing the interface between the frequency holders and the uh, operators who want to use those frequencies. So they could act as brokers for the spectrum. So they will be called spectrum brokers. Spectrum broker, for example, could serve as follows. The frequency holders might say, I want to make my channel available. But how do you do that? Do you go to the uh, operators one by one and uh, try to negotiate with them? It doesn't make much sense. So instead, you, for example, go to the spectrum holder, uh, sorry, the spectrum broker, and say, I want to make this channel available. This is the frequency band. These are the times I'm using it. These are the times I'm not using it very often, and it, during these times, I'm not using it at all. And this is how much I request. This is the price of it. And every frequency holder announces to the spectrum broker this information. Now, the operators who want to make use of the band, rather than going from door to door to find some available frequency, they just go to the broker and they see the whole market of spectrum there. Every band with different properties made available and with their prices. And there you neg negotiate as the operator and get the spectrum and make it available to your user, get the money from the user, and of course share some of your profit with the owner of the spectrum, the spectrum holder, and keep the rest for yourself. Okay? So there will be several parties in this game. In this sense, this looks similar to the stock, uh, stock exchange, as you can see. This is explaining uh, the cognitive radio frequency usage. Like, you have different access types, like the cognitive radio network is shown in red. This is the red network. Uh, by the way, this is the city itself. Over this physical area, you have an existing infrastructure with different technologies, like wireless access points, uh, cellular networks, 3G, 4G, or satellite, whatever. 
And on the same physical space, in the same city, you want to deploy a new network as a cognitive radio network service provider or operator. So you install your cognitive base stations, which will actually map to the same physical locations. And then whatever is left from the other technologies, you try to utilize them. Of course, this picture looks very nice. You seem to be filling in almost every hole. That's not the real case. In reality, you won't be able to fill all of them. Uh, so what are the main functions of cognitive radio? The first and the most important one is actually spectrum sensing. That means listening to the radio environment, looking at the received signal, from the received signal, trying to detect if there's a primary use, if there's a user or not, and if there is, then is it primary or not? And if not, and if you have something to send, try to use it. Okay? That's spectrum sensing, actually. But it's easier said than done. Doing this is quite difficult. What you have actually learned in general, uh, in your earlier courses on wireless networks also apply here. You, you may, for example, fall into problems like hidden terminal pro, uh, problem, whatever. But you have to be able to detect the signal properly. The next is spectrum management. OK, I have some available, uh, by the way, in the, uh, another problem in spectrum sensing is you can do this in a narrow band. The problem is now you have to do it in a very wide band. If you just focus on a single frequency band and try to find the availabilities in that band, you might be unlucky. You might have selected a band which is most of the time busy. And meanwhile, there will be other opportunities which you're missing. So you should be able to listen to a wide spectrum. But it is difficult to listen to a very wide spectrum. So you should have some other means of organizing the nodes, the secondary nodes, secondary users, such that uh, I listen to this portion and you listen to the other portion, another one listens to the other portion, and we actually share this information somehow. Okay? So on the average, everyone will benefit from this. Also, in detecting the primary user, due to the position, due to the radio channel uh, properties, it could be that there's actually a primary user, but I don't hear that primary user well. So I may misunderstand and conclude that there is no primary user and try to transmit. But the channel could, uh, does not necessarily have to be symmetric. It could be asymmetric. So although I cannot hear the primary user, the primary user will hear my transmission, but that will serve as interference to the primary user. So in detecting, it is a better idea to do collaboration with others so that several secondary users listen to the, are organized, they're coordinated, and they listen to the same frequency at the same time. And then they share their measurements. And collaboratively, we decide whether there's a transmitter or not. So that gives better performance. OK, once we have done spectrum management, uh, sorry, spectrum sensing, I detect that this portion of the band is, uh, spectrum is available, this part and this part. Now I want to transmit. Which one should I use? So pick the best available spectrum to meet the communication requirements. But the term best is troublesome. If frequency, let's say F1, is the best, and if I pick the best, but since you're also in the same environment, that will probably be also the best for you. Then you also pick the best. Then we will collide. Although there was frequency F2, so instead of picking F1, if you had selected F2, we would both be able to transmit. So how do we decide on the best one? Spectrum mobility is the third 
case, uh, third phase, which is the maintaining the seamless communication requirements during transition to better spectrum. So you jump from one spectrum band to the other, although maybe you're not mobile. You're not moving at all, but the opportunities, those spectrum holes are changing. Therefore, you still have to do a switch from frequency to fre frequency, as if you're doing a handover. Still maybe under the same base station, but a frequency change. So that's spectrum mobility. And spectrum sharing is providing fair scheduling of the spectrum among coexisting cognitive radio users. So if you look at now this cogn cognition cycle, which gives the name cognitive to our cognitive radios, is as follows. There's actually the radio environment in which there are the primary and secondary users making transmissions in several frequency bands. Altogether, that's our radio environment. So there is some RF stimuli in the environment, and you're sensing those that uh, RF stimuli. Okay? Now, if you detect a primary user, that is using the band you're currently using, then you have to go to spectrum mobility and change your spectrum, switch to another one. So you make it, uh, you do the spectrum uh, mobility and you come up with a decision request and you give it the uh, spectrum decision. And spectrum decision also, in addition to this request, takes all these spectrum holes information from the sensing and makes a decision and determines the channel capacity that is to be used and spectrum sharing provides fair share of the given band between multiple cognitive radio users. Now, according to all this, you will be making a transmission and your transmission contributes to the radio environment. You're modifying actually the radio environment when you do some transmission. So both you and the other cognitive radio users will now be following this modified radio environment. And this cognition cycle continues indefinitely. Okay? So in the second uh, half of the course, we'll be focusing on these parts of the the cognition cycle, but most of our focus will be, as I said, on spectrum sensing, which is a more difficult problem. So what is spectrum sensing? How can you do spectrum sensing? There are different ways of attacking this problem. One is trying to detect the transmitter. Another one is doing cooperative detection or it could be interference-based detection. Mostly you try to do focus on detecting the transmitter. So you can do it using match filter detection with energy detection or cyclostationary feature detection. When you do cooperative sensing, look at this scenario. There's some transmitter. It doesn't always have to be a base station or access point, but there is some primary transmitter. It could still be, for example, an ad hoc network. I don't care. But this transmitter transmits into a range like this. And actually, that guy is trying to communicate this with this primary user. But since typically this has an omnidirectional antenna, then this, uh, while trying to communicate between these two, actually, that signal propagates to all this area. Now, this XG user uh, is trying to communicate with this one. That also transmits in this area. Now, if this primary user now tries to communicate with this one, like this guy is trying to send a signal, a message to this guy. This is trying to send something to this guy. But the transmission of this will also be received here. And it will collide with the transmission, the intended transmission from this transmitter. 
So this guy will suffer from interference. But if it's this guy who is trying to receive, there's no problem there. But the more important thing for us is the interference that's experienced here. So that would be receiver uncertainty problem. And there's also the shadowing uncertainty problem, which is actually very similar. In this case, again, the XG user here is trying to transmit with this guy, tries to sense the environment first. In the previous case, when tried to do sensing, it was out of the scope of this transmitter. That's why it couldn't hear that. Now it is inside the radius, transmission radius. However, due to this obstacle here, the signal fades. And when this guy is sensing, it receives a very weak signal. So it concludes that there is no primary transmitter. Actually, there is. When it does the transmission, it will be properly received by its receiver. However, it will harm this user again. So depending only on your received signal is not a very brilliant idea. Because you didn't receive a strong signal because there was an obstacle between you and the transmitter. But there's no obstacle between you and the other receiver, unintended receiver. That's why you're causing too much interference there. If there was also a wall here, that wouldn't be a problem, but there isn't. And you cannot know that. Okay. So that would be shadowing uncertainty. So you have to cope with these. In that sense, doing collaboration helps us because some other uh, cognitive users could detect this transmitter and inform me. Uh, yet another technology we'll uh, discuss in the course is the wireless rural area networks, WRANs. Typical uh, wireless rural area networks have coverage of more than tens of kilometers in radius. So this is even better for rural areas. It allows fixed and nomadic users and operates at very low frequencies so that actually you can transmit so far. And the technology for that is typically 80222 uh, family. The advantages of the WRANs is that it's possible uh, standard for cognitive radio. It utilizes the underutilized uh, frequencies and it has low infrastructure cost because you have less base stations installed actually. The disadvantage is its low bandwidth and immature technology and also it's not yet standardized. Uh, if you look at wireless wide area networks, the coverage varies as tens of kilometers for 802.20 and partial uh, Earth coverage for next generation satellite networks. It allows fixed and highly mobile users. There's the 802.20 uh, standard for this, also known as mobile broadband wireless access and also next generation satellite networks. But such technologies did not uh, penetrate in the market so much. That would be the end of today's lecture. So what we have done today was to uh, generally discuss what we will be doing during the semester. Uh, next week, we will start with wireless local area networks. And probably we'll be spending two weeks on uh, wireless local area networks. Our focus will be mostly 802.11. We'll also talk about the uh, Hyperland 1 and Hyperland 2, but very briefly. Our focus will be on 802.11 family. Uh, we will be looking at how you uh, organize the coordination between the access point and multiple uh, Wi-Fi nodes, uh, how they uh, communicate. And uh, that will be the end of, in two weeks, that will be the end of Wi-Fi. After that, we will be continuing with WiMAX. Do you have any questions? 
Okay, so thank you all for the first lecture in 591.